Bridge of the Science Podcast with your girl and with an E. Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of the Root of the Science podcast with your girl and with an E. If you are listening and you are new, welcome to the show. It's such a pleasure to have you on. And if you are returning, thank you so much that you can return back. Remember that you can comment, give your opinion um, on this week's episode on Twitter or Instagram or LinkedIn, Facebook, wherever you follow us on social media. If you haven't, please do so. Also a reminder that we have a newsletter. So please make sure to subscribe. It's available on our social media platforms. That way we have in-depth information on past episodes every Friday. It's a weekly newsletter. So you have the audio part as well as the written part. Now let's get into today's episode. Internet and social media have provided new avenues for perpetrators to engage in gender-based violence as it offers anonymity and a wider reach compared to traditional forms of violence. The online environment allows perpetrators to target victims from a distance and often with little fear of consequences. Women and girls are most affected. Violence against women online is a persuasive threat worldwide, especially because in many countries, online violence against women is often blamed on the victim. UNESCO estimates that 73% of women have experienced some type of online violence such as harassment, doxing, revenge pornography, stalking, rape, or death threats, much of which follow victims in their offline lives. Today, we are speaking to Tabitha Wangechi, a woman's digital health activist from Kenya. She will help us understand online gender-based violence and its effects it has on women in the civic sector and other digital security and safety issues. Let's get into this episode, of course, and so much more. Hello, Tabitha. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Anne. I'm glad to be here. It is such a pleasure to have you on the show. So before we get things started, Tabitha, could we just have a brief introduction um, from you in terms of who is Tabitha, where are you currently based, and just briefly, what do you do? Okay, um, first of all, I would like to thank um, the podcast for hosting me, and um, I'm more than happy to share my experience with you and what I do and hopefully get around to understand some of the issues that um, women face in the online space. So I am a digital rights activist and I'm the founder of Digital Rurals. So my journey began with, uh, you know, personal experiences of witnessing Mm -hmm. and at times even being a target of online harassment. In 2016, I left Instagram because um, I was cyberbullied. So these encounters fueled my determination to address the gender-based violence issues, uh, which are more prevalent in digital spaces uh, with the advance in technology and more platforms coming up. So I started by engaging local communities and discussing the challenges that women face online and advocating for a safer environment for women. Fantastic. Um, I'm sorry that you had to go through that, uh, but I'm glad that, you know, the pain um, had purpose to it and that despite what you went through, you were able to make something really positive. Um, Tabitha, I'll be honest with you, and I think this is the case for many people who are probably listening. Um, I didn't even know there was such a thing as a digital activist, right? So you you yeah. touched briefly on how you got into the space given um, your own experience, but like, um, you know, how how would somebody, if they didn't have a negative experience like yourself, how would somebody actually get into the space? How would somebody say, okay, you know what, I'm a digital activist. What does that actually mean? So it could mean different things to different people, but for me, I Mm -hmm. define it as 
being a champion, being a leader, and being an advocate for not only women, but generally a digital rights activist advocate for the rights of all people, um, despite the nationality, the sex um, of the person, and um, you know the social economic status. So to get mm -hmm. into this space, I think it's very fundamental to first define what do I want out of this? Um, and also sure. to try and understand what are the issues in this space, um, which communities can I join, which organizations can I uh, work with or collaborate with in advancing my goal as a digital rights activist. So once you understand mm -hmm. those fundamental things, then they can define your path to becoming the kind of digital rights activist you want to become because there are so many issues in the digital rights space. There's mm. artificial intelligence coming up. Uh, there's gender bias. There's gender violence. You know, there are policy issues. So it's very wide and understanding this scope um, makes it easy for you to understand what you want out of this space as a digital rights activist. Mm. No, um, Thank you for that overview. So let's narrow in into your your space, which is online gender-based violence. Um, and again, this is something that I suppose many people don't realize actually happens, right? Because when we think of gender-based violence, we think of somebody being physically assaulted or sexually assaulted or emotionally or financially. So how does it actually manifest online? How does somebody know, like, okay, you know, this is actually happening to me? Can you walk us, um, can you walk us through that? I'm glad to do that. I mean, um, online gender-based violence is also very wide, and depending on how technology is evolving, there are new ways in which um, online gender-based violence is manifesting, and some of these ways include harassment, uh, threats online spreading harmful content mm. that targets you know women sexual minorities and other groups of people so um some of these issues like cyberbullying doxing or even revenge porn um keep imagining mm. i know the other day there was a huge debate on twitter uh, because a gentleman went ahead and created porn um associated with uh, Tyler Swift, the famous American musician, and there was a debate on how mm. possible mm. is it to actually create, you know, naked images of someone even without having access to more information about them. So there was even debate on whether that person can be persecuted or not. So these are emerging issues um, in the digital space when it comes to online gender-based violence, especially against women. And you find that <clears throat> such actions, they undermine the rights of women, especially in the digital space mm. by violating their privacy. It limits their freedom of expression, brings shame, and also creates an environment that deters them from fully participating in the online space. So I think um, this culture of perpetrating violence against women contributes to a general culture of fear and intimidation, which you know negatively impacts women's ability to enjoy a safe and equal experience in the digital world. So more women are, you know, going silent, um, leaving the online space because of such issues. Yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine. And um, I, I, like you rightfully said in the beginning, that because of what happened to you, you actually left um, Instagram. So I, um, I can imagine for somebody where if this happened to them, they wouldn't want to be anywhere near social media. And like you rightfully said, that it makes them not really fully participate. So you said yeah. there are different forms of 
of online gender violence. You spoke of the the revenge porn, for example. Um, you spoke mm -hmm. of trolling, um, um, etc. So you what what are you what sort of work where do you fit in into this space what sort of work do you do to i don't know potentially help women or <laughs> mitigate this can you talk us through that okay so i love my job and that is one thing i keep telling people whenever i'm invited to speak about uh digital rights issues mm. so uh, it basically involves organizing workshops um, to build the capacity of women on how they can stay safe online. I've conducted several digital security workshops that equip women with the knowledge and skills on how to navigate the digital space safely. I've also participated in awareness campaigns. I've also participated in trainings. I've also participated in um, organizing and also taking part in protests um, few months ago, I remember we had this um, protest in Nairobi mm. fighting against um, the increase in violence against women, both physical and online. And it was so sad and shocking to hear that even after the protest, there were women who were killed for participating in the protest. Wow. And you wow. know, some of these issues were very triggering and it made more women to resort to digital activism, you know, I've never seen that kind of mobilization from the grassroots level to the national level, women coming out in physical and digital spaces to demand that you guys stop killing us, mm -hmm. demand a safe physical and digital environment for us to exist as women. So the other thing, um, I've done is to collaborate with other activists okay. in, you know, organizing events that, you know, sensitize women and bring them together to discuss issues pertaining to their rights and freedoms and comes to the digital space, working with other organizations um, to develop strategies for promoting online safety and advocating for policy changes. So um, I've also participated in a lot of events. I mean, I think that is kind of my daily schedule, just finding events both online and offline that talk about some of these issues, new and emerging issues, existing issues in the digital rights space and issues related to online gender-based violence. So this has allowed me to share my own personal experiences to share my insights mm -hmm. and also to promote a broader understanding of the importance of women's digital rights. Uh, because most people don't think it's an issue. Mm -hmm. um, we are very few activists in this space uh, because people do not really see the threat. They don't really understand the magnitude of um, the impact of violating women's digital rights. So with these campaigns, initiatives, raising awareness in events, you find that we are contributing to creating a cultural shift towards a more respectful and inclusive digital space for not only women, but you know other genders. Incredible, incredible work um, and in terms of what you're doing. And you, you mentioned that, you know, you host workshop and you, you, you attend events. Um, in fact, oh. you were you were recently a Jigsaw Feed Shield Early Adopters Fellow. So can you explain what that fellowship was about and its specific intention to combat um, online harassment? Um, actually, <laughs> I fumbled when you struggled to pronounce it because at first I really had a challenge, you know, just saying feed shield. Um, but anyway, we made it through. Mm -hmm. So it's an online safety tool that was mm -hmm. developed by Jigsaw and Code for Africa. And by the way, shout out to Sarah Gowon. She was the project manager and she was really supportive. Uh, throughout the process, um, she gave us the support that we needed as fellows 
to you know use this tool as an early adopter and really test it on Twitter. So what this tool does is that it's a very powerful web-based tool that uses machine learning to filter out negative comments and trolls only on Twitter. So mm -hmm. um, interestingly, you find that FeedShield is not just a standalone tool that you know um, helps women in the online space to be able to block trolls and filter out negative comments, but it it is also um, a comprehensive, if I may call it, resource toolkit okay. um, that is integrated into the platform, uh, which houses various lessons, um, self-help tools, you know, games um, that help women to understand the broader issues related to, you know, violation of their digital rights and how they can best protect themselves. How exactly does this work? So it's um it's a web based tool. So <clears throat> once you're finding Twitter, you know, mm -hmm. when you're yeah. using Twitter, you just, you know, log in into Fitfield and it automatically links to your account. Okay. So once you link Fitfield to your Twitter account, um it works by using machine learning algorithm to detect and filter out negative comments, abuses, spams, trolls. And what this feature tool does is that it blocks these comments and makes you not to see them. Mm -hmm. So you can choose as a user, do I want to see what these people are saying about me? Do I want to see um, you know, the threats I'm receiving? You can choose to view them or not, depending on, you know, how you approach such issues so mm -hmm. once you do that you can click a button that allows you to create a report of all the negative uh, comments and trolling that you received on that platform and then you can share it with the forensic team at code for africa they have a, a great team of investigative uh, uh, forensic team that can evaluate the report and unmask the trolls and let you know that okay, so and so is operating under this account, and that the one sending you this kind of comment. So it's a very interesting modern tool that you know gives women the freedom of engaging on Twitter without being worried that I'm going to be bullied. They're going to say this about me, or this and this is going to happen to me. So <clears throat> not only do they have a forensic team to, you know, review the report and, you know, give information about the kind of um, online violence you're going through. They also have, you know, a counseling team in a way that mm -hmm. if you have been impacted by um, online violence on that platform and this is your report, this is what is happening, they can be able to direct you to the specialized team of psychologists will now give you that support to go through that process um, in the right way. That sounds absolutely fantastic. Oh my yeah. goodness, that sounds really great. Um, so you said this was an you you, you were testing it as early adopters. So am I correct yeah. in assuming that it's not readily available? For everyone. It is working currently. Um, if you can test it, mm -hmm. it will work. Um, so as early adopters, our work was to give feedback um, so that they can see the areas that need improvement, but the tool is fully functional. Oh, and how does somebody get access to it? So you can just go to... Feed shield. You can go to Google mm -hmm. and type feed shield. So once you type feed shield, it's going to come as the first result, and it's feedshield.africa. Oh, fantastic! So you click on that oh, site, and you can now log in and connect it to your Twitter account. Mm. 
that that's some incredible work mm-hmm. and kudos to the team um for developing uh for developing that tool and this is really exciting so now i'm just going to also yeah this is something positive and this is something that you know there's hope but what are some of the other challenges that you've experienced um so far um in in this in this space of digital activism personally and also just um yeah just in the general online space okay i think that's a very interesting question because um as someone who is facing challenges head on sometimes you don't expect that they're the same challenges that you're going to deal with um as a person so um women digital rights activists they face various challenges and i can say most of them resort to quitting what they're doing and there were stories going on, especially in Kenya, that, you know, a famous activist was bought by the government because she stopped advocating for those issues. But what they didn't realize is that she had expressed um, that her life was in danger uh, because of the kind of work she was doing. So you find that for me, it's mostly intimidation and maybe threats that aim to silence you. Sometimes someone can DM you and say, you're a feminist, you're pretending to be fighting for women's rights. Yes, you, yes, yet you're this, you're that. I mean, just um, people coming up with unrealistic issues to try and silence you or intimidate you because they can see that your work truly has an impact. Uh, because I believe, um, our work is not in vain. The online space is very powerful in a way that you can reach anyone. You can advocate for an issue and they can get your attention and work on it. So the other thing I think is lack of representation and gender bias. I remember I was invited to this meeting um, on digital rights and I was the only woman there and they were not taking me serious because they thought maybe I had escorted someone. So you find that the tech space um, is dominated largely by men. So women are sidelined. There's a lot of gender bias. They're not taken seriously within this space. And this may limit the kind of opportunities we get. Um, I was very offended when I attended this event. It was a whole day event. I won't mention the company that organized the event, but it's in the digital rights space. And I found that almost all the panelists were men, except one panel that had um, the CEO of Testbook, Miss Florence. And I was so sad because I was like, you know, I expected more women to sit on this panel and Mm. give diverse perspectives and especially um, issues around women's rights. So, you know, um, these are some of the issues that we face. And sometimes, you know, balancing your activism with your personal safety is a very huge concern because some activists may become targets of physical harm. I remember Pauline Joroga, she's a very vocal activist in Kenya. And this time she went for vacation and she posted um, her photo, having a good time somewhere in an island. You know, uh, authorities came Mm. for her. She was detained just by posting her photo. So you might be somewhere enjoying yourself, having a good time, but you don't know that there are certain people who are targeting you. And you know, you become susceptible to not only online violence, but also physical violence. So, you know, addressing such issues, attitudes towards um, gender equality end up posing a great challenge, uh, especially Mm -hmm. for women in digital Mm -hmm. rights advocacy. Goodness, that is, yeah. 
that that sounds like it's it's a lot to deal with and um you are doing incredible work and you are very brave uh because yeah. not many people can withstand that type of i want to say heat you know or backlash so um yeah i just i admire the work that you do and i didn't realize um some of the ripple effects for doing this work so um i i i hope that you will continue to to push through despite these um almost scary circumstances at times um and it's been yeah. quite interesting that although you're fighting for this these rights your rights are also being violated in the process which is mm. terrible yeah which is absolutely terrible. So, um, yeah. Tabitha, as we are wrapping up, you know, we just spoke of briefly of, you know, one initiative um, that, uh, that, that you spoke of. But if somebody is interested and maybe they're, um, they want to know more about some other initiatives or strategies um, that could promote digital rights and safe, safety, uh, could you touch on that um, for us as well? Yeah, actually, um, it's an honor to share with you some of these um, strategies. And I like talking more about them so that people can be aware and change their perspective because the more people we reach, the more people we educate, you know, the safer and the better the digital platforms are. So... I would say that the first and uh, very important step is to promote online education, especially on responsible behavior and empathy. This can help people to understand the magnitude of their actions so that if someone wants to tweet something that is not in line with the code of conduct, they can sit back, reflect, and remember how their behavior is going to impact the other person, and perhaps they might change, you know, their approach. So the other thing, I think platforms need to strengthen their content moderation um, efforts, because you find that there are no better mechanisms to report online harassment. And sometimes even when you report, you get shocked because they say it's not violating the platform code of conduct, yet you saw that, you know, this is clearly an offense that someone has committed against you, but then you report and the platform dismisses your concern. I mean, these are some of the big issues that we are facing because no matter how much work we do as digital rights activists, if we don't have the support of the platforms I mean, our work will just be watered down to almost zero or nothing. So that is a very um, important point of intervention. And then the other thing is to empower online communities to stand together as one to fight online harassment. Um, I remember during the protests, women came together as a group and they would come at anyone who would post anything that is not um, in line with the platform values and they would call out that person. I saw that kind of solidarity, which, you know, made me wish that it was an everyday thing in the platform because nowadays you find that if someone is being attacked, harassed or harmed online, most people like to mind their business because maybe they don't want to get themselves in trouble or you know they just want to keep their page clean so it's not their business if someone else is being harassed and then the other thing is to you know which i don't think most people would agree with me because um it has a very thin line between um oppression and you know freedom of expression so this is strengthening laws and regulations to address online harassment and gender-based violence. So I think some of the issues we have is vagueness in our legal 
uh, instruments because you find that issues such as cyberbullying, doxing, or revenge porn, they are not mm. well defined in our legal framework. So you find that it's very easy, you know, it's very hard, sorry, to persecute someone because if you now um, try to understand what they did uh, using the lens of the legal framework, you find that it might not align um, with the legal framework, yet it's an offense. I don't know if that is making sense, but um, you find that penalties also yeah. for such offenses, they are very minor. You know, it's taken as if it's a petty crime, yet some of these issues, for example, like online violence, someone can threaten you, I will kill you, or I will rape you. And they end up doing it. And you find that it's not seen as an offense uh, because it's not clearly stipulated in the legal framework. So these are some of the issues that, you know, we need to uh, look through, review, and make proper changes. And then the other thing is we need to strengthen collaboration efforts between, you know, government, government should work with civil societies, you know, even to amend some of these legal frameworks. And then um, technology companies need to work with advocacy groups and get feedback on some of the work that we're doing on online gender-based violence and, you know, online harassment and content moderation. So once we get around this kind of collaboration and partnership, then we can create comprehensive strategies that protect individuals from online harm while, you know, respecting freedom of expression. So um, I'd also like to mention that we're currently working on developing a toolkit that can help women in the digital space uh, to stay safe by, you know, bringing a collection of resources and tools and information that can educate them on how to navigate the digital landscape with all the threats and the emerging issues that artificial intelligence is presenting. I'm really excited about that. That sounds so exciting, Tabitha. Thank you for sharing all of these resources. And um, yeah, it seems like this, this, there's still a long way to go. Um, in terms of implementation and the idea of collaboration, particularly on the law side, I think that's where there's a lot of gray area. But I'm sure because this field and this space is still in its infancy and um, mm. the way that technology is rapidly, rapidly um, changing, mm. I hope that we can catch up in terms of, you know, these implementation of the laws and the types of policies and education of people. And this conversation, I think, is just one way that we can do that. And I hope um, the listeners um, really took heed of the information that you you shared with us. And I'm so grateful because I also had an opportunity to learn. So thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Annie. Thank you so much for hosting me. And um, in case of anything, you can follow up with me and I'll be able to share more information. I have a blog. I post a lot on my page, on Twitter, and also on LinkedIn. Thank you so much for hosting me. Oh, it's a pleasure and we'll definitely share some of your links to your work so that people can get in touch um, and to everybody else who's tuned in thank you so much for listening to another episode of the root of the science podcast with your girl and with an e until next time goodbye